Inside New Orleans Sports with Eric Asher is underwritten by... Located on Lake Pontchartrain, Brisby's Lakefront Restaurant and Bar offers traditional West End favorites, a scenic view, oysters, and numerous tasty options. More information is available at 504-304-4125 or brisbysrestaurant.com. At Villaries Florist, we deliver the magic of flowers seven days a week to the North Shore and South Shore in the New Orleans area. Whether it's for birthday parties, baby celebrations, Villaries provides colorful floral displays for all. With a store full of fresh cut flowers, exotic tropical flowers, orchids, roses, and even fruit baskets, our goal is to make your vision a reality. Villaries Florist, proudly serving Louisiana since 1969. Mr. Ed's Oyster Bar and Fish House has been shocking here since 1979. Located at 3117 21st Street in Metairie, Mr. Ed's Oyster Bar and Fish House offers raw, fried, and grilled oysters as well as a range of Cajun and Creole dishes. Enjoy a dozen with a smile. Good evening, New Orleans, and welcome to another edition of Inside New Orleans Sports. I'm your host, Eric Asher. Over the next hour, we cover all the home teams. New Orleans Saints, the LSU Tigers, the Tulane Green Wave. If we have time, we'll touch on Pelican injuries. Got a great panel, as always. Robert O'Shields of ABC 26 Sports, WGNO TV here in New Orleans, and Brett Martell of the Associated Press join us tonight on the program. Gentlemen, thanks for coming down, as always. Really appreciate the time. Tell the folks a little bit about what's happening, Robert, over at uh, ABC 26. Well, of course, we got Friday Night Football in our 26th season at Daniels, J.T. Curtis. I think uh, most marriages last longer than 26 years. <laughs> so we, uh, we've kicked it off, wow, we're almost a month into it. And uh, we got exciting games this Friday night as well. And uh, you can always catch that on our website, WGNO.com, streaming live as well. Beautiful. And, of course, cover the Saints. Cover the Saints, all, all. LSU, Tulane, yep. everything we're talking about, talking about tonight, Beautiful. we cover it as well. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm. Brett, welcome back to the show, and tell us about, again, the historic Associated Press. Yeah, AP has uh, been around since 1846, one of the largest and oldest news, news organizations in the world, uh, based in New York. Um, I'm the sports correspondent for the state, so they rely on me to cover all the major stuff mm -hmm. going on here, NFL, NBA, major yep. college. Well, gentlemen, thank you again. We appreciate the time tonight. Uh, Preseason in the books, uh, really across the board. This, don't you feel a little different vibe today? than maybe we felt last year or the year before. And I'm talking across the board, Saints, LSU, Tulane. There's, there's kind of a, uh, an air of optimism out there about the seasons this year where uh, I think, you know, in the past there were question marks about LSU, question marks about Tulane, even question marks about the Saints in terms of how much talent they had and how far they can go. I think fans are feeling a little bit more optimistic so far. I think so, but then you also have to, you know, we've, we've been around this area yes. before, with the same situation. You kind of want to just like... Okay, let's take it one step. You almost have to be a coach. You can take it one game at a time, one step mm -hmm. at a time, to see what these teams uh, produce. Yeah, Brett, would you? Would you? And you're the optimist of the group, right? Because <laughs> I mean, you know, most of the time you're very optimistic. I mean, do you yeah. feel it from people that you talk to? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say I'm so optimistic as just try to be, uh, you know, using the big picture perspective, maybe unemotional in my assessments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I've seen how teams can go from bad to good or good to bad very quickly. Um, but certainly, um, if you look at the Saints right now and the performance of the defense in the preseason, um, there are reasons, um, even though they were going against Villa schemes, to be optimistic about how they look. Mm -hmm. um, you pretty much know what to get from the offense. Uh, LSU was impressive in their opener, and mm -hmm. although you don't want to read too much into how Tulane did against Grambling's defense, um, you know, which just wasn't performing very well. Yes. Uh, the, the new quarterback looks like he can handle it. I mean, mm -hmm. he had, you know, three touchdowns of the year, and I believe one running. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, and um, so they're, they're looking better than they have in the past. Yeah, no, no doubt. And, and look, uh, I mean, uh, it's better than the alternative, what we've had around here for a while. Um, everybody that I, that I talk to on, on the radio show, social media, just people that stop me and, and, and want to talk about the teams, everybody asks me the first question is, the, is always the same. 
is this defensive performance we've seen in the preseason, is it real? Is it fool's gold? And, you know, again, I want to I want to believe it's real. I, I think the town has been upgraded. Uh, I think they're a, they have a higher high IQ in terms of football IQ. I think they're a smarter team. Uh, I just don't know when you're dealing with these, uh, as, as Brett mentioned, you know, these vanilla schemes in, in, in preseason, if you really can get a gauge on how good a team is. Um, Robert, you've been at, at practice. You've seen more practices. Obviously, I've seen the games. What's your synopsis? What do you what do you think about this team, this defense, uh, as they get ready to open up against Minnesota? Oh, I always go by the rule is I wait till after like week three or four mm-hmm. just to see how it's done. Because in the preseason, the first team is only out there for a set amount of plays, and then they're that team is rested, you know. And I want to see them go all four quarters, and that's why I kind of give them. Um, at least till week three, week four. This defense, though, through practice and through what we've seen in the preseason, they've done quite well. They have done what they needed to do. I mean, they let, let's look at the Texans game. Uh, they they got to Deshaun Jackson. They got to Savage, and they kind of threw them all threw both of those quarterbacks off, and to the point where, like, I even noticed Deshaun Watson. Even though they're supposed to name him, the, it looks like they're going to name him the starter, maybe. I, I think they would want to make him the starter. I mean, he's a Heisman mm-hmm. Trophy winner, and he's a national champion winner. Um, he just he reminded me of looking at Jay Cutler playing for the Bears. He just was frustrated. He just didn't make good reads. He was just, just, just bad on the field. And I think that defense really fed off that, and they, I think they seem like they've gone better. Mm-hmm in each preseason. Yes. Red, Red, you've seen every practice. You've been out there. I mean, uh, uh, your thoughts. I mean, is it real? I mean, can, can, can people hang their hat on this defense just based off on preseason? I, I don't know if the rate of sacks is real because they had 17 yes. in the, right. in the oh, preseason, which yes. is better than four and a quarter per game. <laughs> right. um, and a lot of that, you know, you're dealing with opposing offensive lines who they're trying to evaluate a guy mm-hmm. and they're putting him in difficult situations and they don't have a special scheme designed to, to you know, maybe double team the Saints best pass rusher, rusher etc. However, uh, you know, that's still a lot of sacks and more than we're used to seeing from them, which is a good indication of guys who are capable of winning their individual battles and showing potential. Now, in terms of coverage, um, you know, scheme plays a role, but a lot of times when you're talking about man-to-man coverage, it's really just the ability of yes. the guy to cover. Do you think they have the, the, the cornerbacks with the ability to cover one-on-one? It seems to be encouraging, yeah. I mean, P.J. Williams, you know, is easy to underrate because mm-hmm. his rookie season, he missed it all with, an, with a preseason injury. Yes. And then last year, he, was, he came right back and was good enough to start and got a concussion in game two and missed the rest of that season. Yes. You know, he might be really good. He was, uh, if I remember right, I'm trying to remember if he was a second or third round pick in 2015 out of Florida State. He was third. 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 Um, and uh, yeah, he was the first one before mm-hmm. Garrett Grayson, mm-hmm. um, which didn't work out. Yeah. But that's another story. And then, uh, you know, Marshawn Lattimore, a lot of people thought the Saints were lucky to get him mm-hmm. at 11. And although his preseason didn't start out well because of the tweaked knee, mm-hmm. since he has come back, he has only been beaten underneath when he's been giving a cushion. Where the, where the play was designed yes. to maybe allow the guy mm-hmm. to get the underneath catch and then you tackle him right away. He was never beaten deep. That's a good sign. And Kenny Vaccaro said in the locker room today, when they've watched the tape, uh, secondary coach Aaron Glenn has told them, you know, you guys are doing all the right things. If you keep doing this in the regular season, you'll be in good shape. And Kenny said, I've been waiting for us to stop making these, I, I've been waiting for these mistakes to stop showing up on film for three years and they've stopped showing yeah. up. Which, so which lends to the high IQ, right? I mean, yeah. I think they're a smarter team right now. Yeah. You know, and I think that might be by design in the offseason. Is this a team that can cover, in, in your opinion? I mean, are they better in the secondary, safety, and, and, and cornerback? Yeah, I mean, let's think about this. I remember when the Saints got a guy named Jason David. Mm-hmm. They thought that it was the best thing to happen right. in the secondary. And then week one, they go to, we go to New England, I mean, I, Indianapolis. Yeah. Uh, his former team mm-hmm. and Peyton Manning and them play like super techno bowl against Jason David. Mm-hmm. They picked on him that whole night. Remember that? Mm-hmm. And it was just touchdown after touchdown. I think, you know, every Saints fan that was watching that game thinking had Super Bowl visions was like, oh boy. Yes. Or they were, that was the censored version of what I just said. Yes. They were saying something else. Um, you know, I, I definitely believe they are. I mean, I, I just think based on what we've seen, I think that, 
you know, uh, it was a blessing in disguise that a lot of players got to play last year and got, got some experience as young players, and I think that's transform, trans, transferred itself to, uh, to this season. Uh, it'll be interesting to see, first of all, if they can stay healthy. I mean, you lose Delvin Bro, that, that's a blow at this point. But, um, you know, Ken Crawley looks like he's, you know, he's got the ability to play in the league. Devontae Harris looks like he's got the ability to play in the league as well. And then you look at the safety position, you know, from, from Williams to, um, uh, to uh, you mentioned Vaccaro, uh, to Bell. But all these guys look like they can play in the NFL. Uh, these are not undrafted free agents, even though Crawley and Harris are, that, you know, you're just kind of scraping the bottom to fill the bottom half of the roster. These guys are legitimate players. Yeah, and well, and also, you know, you have Rafael Bush back to be kind yeah. of like a veteran presence go. and a locker room presence and kind of a guy you can rely mm -hmm. upon if you need to with an injury uh, in the safety position. Um, and yeah, when Bro comes back, it'll be interesting to see how that works out. It looks like Devontae Harris might be the nickelback now mm -hmm. ahead of Crawley. I'm not sure about that, but that's kind of what it looks like to me right. in practice, um, which and, is surprising. And Sterling like, Moore yeah, is, is, is a, is a and, steady guy. Yeah, yeah and St Sterling Moore also is a steady guy that mm -hmm. can rotate in right. Mm -hmm. So um, they seem to be in pretty good shape mm -hmm. there. The linebacker core is going to be fascinating to watch because of all the turnover. Mm -hmm and uh, the potential to see how they mesh with uh, linebackers coach um, Mike Nolan, who's new, obviously, for right. coming, you know, replacing Joe Vitt. Right. And then the, and, and up front, even though they lost Nick Fairley, um, they seem to be getting a good deal of pressure. And, you know, it, another guy who's easy to overlook is how Oliki Kaha, mm -hmm. who was uh, missed all of last season, was, his, right. was his, with his third ACL surgery. Yes. And they've been encouraged by him and the addition of Alex Okafor, defensive yeah. end. You know, guys, I, I think it's... You can see it with your eyes, the difference in the linebacking core. Uh, there's an upgrade there in talent across the board. I mean, last year they brought Craig Robinson and Nate Stupar in to be special teams players, and they ended up being two of the best linebackers they had all, uh, in that core. Uh, you know, they're still waiting on Stephon Anthony. I'm glad they did not cut him. I thought they were going to put him on injury reserve. I just think he's got too much physical ability to be able to put him out there and then maybe let somebody else, you know, be able to uh, uh, maybe fi he finally gets it and then he's a player for them. But, you know, I think you look across the board, whether it's, it's Klein or Teo, uh, you know, uh, you look at the, at, the, at the rookie Anzalone, I think that they've, they've upgraded that position. I think it's visible they've upgraded that position. You know, guys that are, that are tackling, sure tackling, and, you know, sideline to sideline for the longest time, one of the things that got to me about the Saints defense was they were like, like plow horses going against thoroughbreds. They just weren't fast enough and, and athletic enough in some cases to get sideline to sideline. I think we've seen that, again, they're a little bit more athletic this year. They're definitely a smarter linebacking core. Yeah, I think um, they did a good job with the linebacks, linebackers. Linebackers are almost, if you want to compare them to the offensive side, they're almost like the quarterback because they're right there in the middle of the field and they have to see what's going on on that offensive side. Either it's gonna, they're going to pass or they're going to run. So they can go and tack, make the tackle on a running back or drop back and, and protect that middle part of the field where you got your slant routes, your short routes, the tight ends, or what have you, or dump to the um, running back for a screen. They have to be smart and they have to be very physical and fast. And uh, this group that they got back there seems like they, they, they know what they're doing and they, are, they have the physical ability right. to do that. Right. And, and I like, uh, what, what's your thoughts on the linebacker core before we move on? Well, uh, I mean, Klein is getting heavy praise, um, not only for his ability and his sure tackling, but his ability to communicate mm -hmm. and um, really help people get lined up. I mean, he was playing behind Luke Keekley in Carolina, and uh, he is helping the Saints be alignment and assignment sound in a very good way. And I think that Anzalone is a really nice surprise. I mean, people thought he was talented, but he was in and out of the lineup at Florida last yeah. year because of injuries. Mm -hmm. He has looked like a world beater yeah. in Saints camp, you know, and in good, instinctive too, and in getting behind the line of scrimmage and, mm -hmm. and getting to people. And then, um, you know, uh, Manti Teo um, is a guy that also is easy to underrate because he's had injury problems in the past. Mm -hmm. He's looked pretty solid. He looks like a heady player too. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so, I. I think there's a lot of reasons for optimism there. And Stephen Anthony um, looked like he was practicing today. Mm -hmm. You know, he's, Kenny Vaccaro thinks that people should have more patience with him. Um, of course, he's a teammate, so you gotta put a grain of salt yeah. on that. But, you know, he thinks the guy was thrown into middle linebacker in his rookie year, then they moved him in his second year. And, uh, and so really this is his, really this would be his second year and his kind of his current role, but he's been bouncing around from position to yeah. position, and then he had an injury in, during the preseason. So 
I think the Saints coaches agree with you that it's too early to give up on a guy with that much talent that you took 31st overall in, yeah. you know, in, uh, in 2015. Right. 2015, yeah. 15, yeah. You know, guys, you mentioned uh, not blowing assignments, uh, knowing, knowing wh wh what they need to do. Uh, they, Mike Nolan's made these linebackers interchangeable as well. So, again, you have to know multiple positions. Yeah, I mean, we've seen a lot of changes in these last preseason of different guys. You look at them and, oh, he was, nope, he's moved over here. Um, so I guess, I mean, maybe that's something to look forward to in the future just in case if somebody were to go, go down, you have somebody that can fill that void mm -hmm. and fill that spot just in case in an emergency situation if something were to happen on the field um, to, to interchange those yeah. positions. They're also trying to be unpredictable. And um, it's a bonus when an offense can't assume what, or presume what you're going to do based on the personnel on the field. Yes, that's a great point. It, and, so, I, and I think that's part of my design, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, right. they were looking for players who were versatile and, uh, and would, you know, not, and would minimize mistakes. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, you know, they're trying, to, they're trying to have a little bit more of a Belichick-style defense, mm -hmm. if you will. You yes. Know? So. Gotcha. Guys, uh, up the middle is going to be critical. Obviously, linebacker safety, but also up the middle on the defensive line. You mentioned missing missing Nick Fairley. Um, uh, when you look at the young players they have at the defensive tackle and the, the nose tackle position, uh, are they grown enough to make a difference this season? Well, I mean, Rankins, I think, looks really good. And, you know, he missed the first half of last season. I think it was a fractured fibula or some kind of lower leg injury, if I recall. There's so many injuries, it's hard to keep right. them all straight. But, um, you know, so, you know, he really only played half of year one. He's looked uh, like a real force to be reckoned with. Um, and Onyemata seems to have taken some major strides. I, I mean, he, he seemed to be causing a lot of havoc mm -hmm. in the backfield. And uh, he was involved, I think, against the Ravens in that turnover. There was a mm -hmm. sack fumble. Yes. Um, was it Muhammad that maybe yes, it was. had the sack and strip mm -hmm. and Onyemata recovered? Mm -hmm. But they were... You know, I mean, for a guy who grew up in Nigeria and learned to play football in Canada in college, I mean, he's he's in the right place right, now at right. the right time. And, and Davidson's been pretty steady since he's been here. Yeah, Davidson's been a steady guy right. too, and was a really solid player out of Fresno State. He wouldn't right. have been drafted otherwise. So. I was a little surprised by uh, Mitchell. Is it Lowen? Um, is that uh, uh, Mitch Laven? I Laven. Yeah, Laven. How I pronounce it? it. I, I thought he would be a, a, a practice squad candidate. I was surprised that he made the, the roster, but between what he's done on special teams. And, and of course, his ability to be able to uh, again either uh, run run stop or, or, or rush the passer. I, I got obviously landed him on the final 53. That was one of the surprising cuts to me. I'm going to get the surprising cuts as well. But they've got a rotation there now. I was a little surprised they didn't keep McDaniel. It'd be it'd be interesting to see if they bring him back down the line here. They probably will. I mean, they they brought didn't they bring somebody recently back? Uh, Coon within the last yeah, day or Kuhn. so. So I mean, yeah, even though these guys get cut. There's always a good chance of, I remember not too long ago, Austin Johnson was cut, brought back, cut, brought right. back, and he was a, he was a fullback, but uh, I, you know, yeah, we'll, we'll probably see him back. A lot of that's just veteran stuff where they don't have to guarantee the contract for the entire mm -hmm. year, so they, they, they keep him off the roster for the first week and then they bring him back on. But then you're chancing allowing one of these young players that you're moving to the practice squad, you're chancing losing one of those players to, to, to another team. Your, your, your thoughts on the interior of the defensive line? The de defensive line, it looks great, I mean, from left to right. Um, they, once again, I didn't see that with working with prep football on Friday. Sure. We didn't see, the, didn't see that much of the Ravens game, but mm -hmm. I did see the last one, it was the Texans, and they did well against that Texan front. Now, Brett mentioned, you know, that's also depends on their offensive line, who they were looking at. But if you were judging it by that, well, now that's what I'm judging it by, is they seem to be doing well, and that also uh, works out great for, for, Jor uh, for Cam Jordan and them to, to get to the quarterback or get to the running back to make those keep uh, tackles for losses. Yeah, I like the, the addition of Okafor. You mentioned yeah. Moe Kakaha. Uh, and, and then also the ability to be able to blitz from, from different positions. We've seen a lot of blitzing through the A and B gap. You know, through linebackers and safeties. So again, the unpredictability of, of where you're going to come from to be able to create pressure. Yeah, I think they're uh, they're doing a, a good job mixing up their blitzes, and um, and the pressure was showing in quarterback inaccuracy. Um, you know, they didn't have a, a ton of turnovers in terms of interceptions, but. 
the end of the preseason, I mean, they, they allowed five touchdowns the whole preseason by an offense. You know, the one was, it was the Chargers had an interception return. Yes. But opposing offenses scored five touchdowns in four games, only two through the air against a defense that ranked last against the pass. And, you know, again, it's, there's something just to be said for the chemistry in the defensive back room, even if it's subs going against subs, about how they're gelling and understanding the message and executing, mm -hmm. you know, no matter whether it's first, second, or third team on the field. I think that you can, it's, you don't really want to read into the final scores, but you can read a little bit into the, just the way they play. Yes, I agree. Yeah. And, I mean, it reminds me, God, I, don't even, I shouldn't even go there, but I, I, do, I do recall in 2009 the team looked really good in the preseason. Right. They didn't look that good this preseason, mm -hmm. but they, they just, it just felt different watching yes. them. It just there was a level of competence that I, I hadn't noticed before, and so that's why you, you can be cautiously optimistic. Right. Guys, we, we, we've talked about all on this program with both you guys about the coaching situation. Peyton maybe staying with some with some guys that that again were really good friends of his, guys that he really relied on, uh, that were you know his confidants in the coaching ranks, uh, especially on the defensive side of the ball. We've seen a turnover now across the, on all three levels of the defense in terms of coaching over the last couple of years, and I think it's paying off. I think you're seeing the payoff. I think you are. Um, I know that bringing back Curtis Johnson for the wide receivers, mm -hmm. I just noticing from, from mini camp to, to training camp, you kind of see the difference on wide receivers. Um, and bringing a familiar face in Curtis Johnson back to New Orleans, I know he was with Chicago before mm -hmm. he came to the Saints. Yeah. And when you talk to Peyton, when we talk to Peyton after practices or just any time, he loves CJ. Uh, he was there when CJ got the head coaching job at Tulane. I mean, he was front and center for that press conference. And to bring somebody back that he's very comfortable with, that he doesn't have to um, manage the wide receiver position. I know that, um, the guy before him, can't think of him, now he's gone to the, being the offense coordinator for the Jets. Um, I think maybe there might have been some issues. Um, maybe that's why we don't have a Brandon Cooks. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But bringing a guy like CJ and these other guys back, uh, or guys that he knows, like mm -hmm. Nolan, um, I think uh, Peyton is now, I think he feels comfortable of letting, the, as the saying, let the coaches coach right. and not micromanage each position. He can just, he can just be the head coach. Mm -hmm. And call the plays and what and and what have you. Well, there's a trust factor with Dennis Allen. We know that. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the guy that was his handpicked guy. But you know, you mentioned it. Aaron Glenn, uh, Mike Nolan, the defensive line coach across the board. Guys with a different voice, a different attitude, different way of teaching the game as well. Yeah. Well, C.J. and Allen were guys that left because they had better opportunities, yes. and Peyton supported them, and didn't want to lose them. Um, but he was able to get them back because for whatever reason their other opportunities didn't work out and there's always a lot of factors involved in that. Um, but, uh, and in fact, Dennis Allen's first opportunity did work out as a defensive coordinator so well that he got hired as a head coach in Oakland, which was dysfunctional at the time and that's why that didn't work out. <laughs> yes. So he's coming back to a job as a defensive coordinator here, or came back to a job, I should say, where he was successful in Denver and, uh, and people thought he would be. Uh, CJ too, uh, you know, went to be head coach at, at Tulane, and um, you can argue that that is, uh, you know, a, a difficult job. Yes, sure. and it has been for a lot of people. He so got to a bowl game, <laughs> and he, he did. did. He did yeah, get he did. to a bowl game. He did. he did all right, but you know, maybe his forte is with receivers. And if you look at the receiver core that he made fantastic in those first few years, you know, Marcus Colston, a guy out of Hofstra, Lance Moore, an undrafted free agent mm -hmm. out of Toledo. Right. You know, guys like Debra that. Henderson Robert couldn't Peter. catch the ball at LSU. All of a sudden, the guy can catch the football, right? Right, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, he did a great job with a lot of guys there. And so, um, clearly, Sean Payton uh, left at the opportunity to bring him back. And then I do think that you can't overlook the significance of Payton being willing to move on from guys to which he was very loyal and had been here a long time. I mean, Vitt was here since 06. Yes. He was here for 11 years. Right. And with Mann almost that long on special teams. Mm -hmm. um, Johnson so, and as well. Then, then, yeah, Johnson was here with, during the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, he had to he had to make some hard decisions right. that he was willing to make. I think that he felt he needed to improve the team. But you, I think you see the difference. It's, it's not hard to see the difference in how these guys are prepared, uh, uh, the techniques that they're using, uh, I think uh, I think it's noticeable. I think it's noticeable. Just, even for the average fan, it's noticeable out there. 
And, and of course, uh, for guys that are covering the team on a day in and out basis, you're hearing the voices out there. You're hearing, you're hearing these guys coach in, in practice. Have you seen it uh, noticeably in terms of practice on how they're dealing with players? Well, I mean, for I'll talk about him again, CJ. Well, CJ wasn't at practice or training camp early because he was in a car accident. People mm -hmm. don't know that. No, I had no idea. And, yeah, he was in a serious car accident, and um, he wasn't on the field. But when he got back, it was so funny. You would think, like, he'd be easy on the guys. You know, he just went through this traumatic car accident. And then I see him out there with, um, it's not really a baseball bat. It's like a bat, but then it's got a cushion top. And he's out there whacking the receivers, trying to knock the ball away. And he's running, like he's physically running. And I'm laughing, and um, I was telling, talk to my coworker Ed Daniels, and saying, "That's funny because like this guy has just gotten a just a traumatic car accident. Here he is out running 20, 30 yards with receivers, trying to catch up with them and hitting them with the bat and trying to knock the ball out. Um, but yeah." It, and the coach and the other coaches as well. You can, you can hear them uh, mm -hmm. yell at them and, and, and really get on these guys because I think they know that this year has to be a very big, a big change yes. from from the years past. Right. And they they know the significance, even though they don't say that to mm -hmm. us when we go in the mm -hmm. locker room and put a microphone mm -hmm. or a tape recorder in their face and there's a light shining in the face. Um, but deep down, they know that this yeah. is, has got to be a big year. Yeah. I mean, but, but it would be hard for anybody to out yell Joe Vitt. I mean, yeah. so, you know, you, you can't expect right. Mike Nolan to do that. But, but CJ could, could, could maybe give him a run for his money, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. CJ could. But, um, I mean, this, I think this, the key is the ability of the guys they have in there now to relate to uh, modern players and the modern game and the mm -hmm. way in which it has evolved over the last few years, you know? And so, mm -hmm. I mean, Joe Vitt had been a good coach for a long time, effective coach, but he, I mean, he was with Baltimore, I think in the, God, I wanna say, um, I mean, the Baltimore Colts, mm -hmm. you know? Right. So he's been around a long time. He's been time. around a long time. No, he had, <laughs> he had what, over 30 year NFL career, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so. Right, no doubt. Guys, um, do you expect much of a change in the offense this year, especially with the backfield they have now with Peterson and Kamara now with his skill set, uh, Ingram with his skill set, uh, you know, we've always said that, you know, when the Saints run the football, and we pr proved out in the, in the Super Bowl year, they run the football effectively, they're, they're a much better offense. Uh, you've got some young receivers, um, but yet receivers that have in the past have been able to, be, in the short term, been able to be counted on. Um, uh, do you see a change in the offense at all? I think Mark well, Ingram is going to be the, the back, and then Adrian Peterson will be that short yardage will, will person. Will it be 80-20 like we saw at Hightower last year, or will it, will it be a little bit different in terms no, of I the think, carries? No, I think it's going to be more 70-30. Mm -hmm. I think I think Peyton's got, Peyton knows that Peterson is a big dude. I mean, jokingly, everyone says that his handshake is like just mm -hmm. a vice grip. Um, I think if, if, if you had to choose between Mark Ingram or Adrian Peterson on third and three or third and four, I think he's going to go with Peterson because Peterson can – Almost, almost like a fullback situation where he can grab the ball, lower his head, and plow over some guys to fight for those three or four yards for the first down or, or a touchdown. I don't see Mark doing that. I think Mark is just a, just a head shake, head shake, head mm -hmm. shake, and try to fool people. And nowadays, defensive, they, they are just locked in and waiting for that head shake or something to happen. And I think that's what's going to happen. 70-30 on, on that. On that area. Yeah, I think Peterson still has a very, very special knack, similar to what Deuce McAllister had in his last really good year, uh, of being patient and strong enough to set up and leverage his blocking the best possible for however they're blocking that play. And mm -hmm. so even though he only had a handful of snaps in the one preseason game he played, you notice he got two or three yards every carry yes. with very average blocking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he just found a way to wedge himself into the weakest spot in the defense mm -hmm. and plow forward for two to three yards every single time. He didn't break anything. He said after the game, I always felt like we were one block away, but you know, running backs say that all the time. Um, but he wasn't being caught in the backfield, hesitating, moving laterally, he was going forward every time. And we've seen them be frustrated in the past with third and short yardage. Yes. And I think that they're, they look at Adrian Peterson and they're saying that's not happening again with us. At the same time, I would look for Sean Payton to try to be creative with Adrian Peterson wherever he can. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Mark Ingram looks like the younger, 
quicker, more vigorous, more versatile mm -hmm. running back. And then, of course, you know, um, Alvin Kamara will work his way in there, too, as well. And I think he's a wild card because yeah. I think he has the ability to run on the inside more than I think what people thought he would be coming out of Tennessee. And, and we know he had the skill set he has in terms of catching the football. Yeah, I think, he's yeah. I think so, too. And Deuce said something that I thought was very interesting while I was just standing with him at mm -hmm. practice one day. And he was saying, you know, as far as Peterson goes, they don't need him or expect him to be the guy he's been in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. If he is an upgrade over what you got last year from Tim Hightower, then he is worth it. Yeah. yeah. And, and it appears that he, he could be at least that and maybe a lot more. And a very cap-friendly contract as well. Yeah. Uh, what about the wide receiving core? How much do they miss Willie Sneed these first three games? Um, ooh, I guess it depends on the teams they're playing. Mm -hmm. You do, I mean, you still have... You still have Mike Thompson, Mike mm -hmm. Thomas out there. You mm -hmm. still got some good receivers that that can fill that void. Now, I'm trying to think of a scenario. Maybe like if you do a short pass and mm -hmm. and then Willie takes off, maybe you miss that. Mm -hmm. But I think there's, I think there's enough guys back there, mm -hmm. out there to 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 fill that for at least three games. The way I look at it is when they were Colston, Warren, Henderson, or you know the trio like that, mm -hmm. or Meacham, when Moore went out. Did they still move the ball? Yes. <laughs> and and I would say that you know Willie Sneed's kind of like the modern Lance mm -hmm. Moore, but you have Mike Thomas. Now what you need is for Brandon Coleman to look as good in the regular season as he looked in the preseason. Mm -hmm. You got Ted Ginn stretching the field. You need him to not drop the ball. Right. And then you have to give I think Sean Payton and Drew Brees credit for their history of putting their heads together and saying forget about who's not here, who is here. What are they good at, and how are we going to put them in position to succeed? You're probably going to have three healthy tight ends who are big guys, uh, Ho'omano Wanui and uh, Fleener, mm -hmm. um, who's in his second year and hopefully is going to make, for the Saints, hope he's going to make a big jump um, and be more like the Jimmy Graham type threat. And then, of course, you have Josh Hill, yes. um, so who's healthy again. So there's a lot of ways, and then Kamara we mm -hmm. talked about. There's, a lot, there's still a lot of ways to distribute the ball through the air. Guys, we're going to take a quick break. We come back. I want to uh, continue the Saints conversation for a few minutes. I want to get to LSU and Tulane. You're watching Inside New Orleans Sports. Brett Martell, the Associated Press. Also, uh, Robert O'Shields of ABC 26 Sports are our guests tonight. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Located at 3701 Iberville Street in Mid-City is Katie's Restaurant and Bar. Open seven days a week, Katie's offers daily specials for lunch, dinner, and Sunday brunch. Serving New Orleans cuisine such as fried shrimp platters, grilled redfish, and a fully stocked bar. And don't forget about our expanded event seating and local entertainment. Featured on the Best of Food Network's diners, drive-ins, and dives, Katie's Restaurant and Bar. Amco Fence, locally owned and operated since 1976. Fully licensed and insured and a member of the BBB, Amco serves both residential and commercial customers. If you're looking to repair, replace, or install a fence for security or aesthetic reasons, Amco Fence supplies wooden, metal, chain link, vinyl, and ornamental or automatic gates. Amco aims to satisfy your fencing needs. Amco Fence, 504-468-9559 or amcofencecompany.com. TikTok Cafe, located on Causeway South at the I-10 in Metairie, is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Our menu offers breakfast dishes like our Western omelet, made from scratch biscuits, grits, egg sunny side up, and lunch specials like our homemade cheeseburgers with a side of golden brown fries. Don't forget about our weekday lunch special and that every Tuesday is steak night. TikTok Cafe, open 24-7 at Causeway South at the I-10 in Metairie. Welcome back to Inside New Orleans Sports. I'm your host, Eric Asher. Robert O'Shields of ABC 26 Sports and Brett Martell of the Associated Press are our guests tonight. Guys, um, surprising cuts uh, on the team, surprises that made the team. I'll throw mine out there quickly. Um, uh, I thought, uh, again, not signing a veteran offensive lineman is a surprise to me. Uh, bringing back the offensive lineman on the practice squad uh, to the degree they did surprised me as well. I, I didn't see a lot out of those guys because I wasn't in practice. Uh, I didn't see enough out of them to think that they were projects that maybe you could work on and, um, you know, maybe they'd be future starters or future backups on this team. But, again, the coaches probably saw more than, obviously, most of us did. Um, I had mentioned, uh, 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 is it Lo uh, I'll say it again. Laven. Laven. Laven, come on the, on the, uh, on the, on the active roster, as, as well as Trey Edmonds, who, I, again, I thought 
might be a practice squad guy. And then Armstead not going on the, on the PUP or the short-term IR, which probably means that he's going to come back fairly quickly, at least quicker than we thought he was. Anything that kind of stuck out to you guys that maybe surprised you about the final cuts? Uh, guys that made the team didn't make the team. Well, we were just quickly talking. I, I thought Big Hill was going to make uh, the, at least the practice squad and one, one day initially, but he is now back on the practice squad. Um, not really, not really surprised about Garrett Grayson. Mm -hmm. I think um, they gave him enough opportunities, and um, I guess his performance the, the last two preseason games was was it for him. Yes, but not really. I mean, I think if you look at the roster from when it was at the start of camp to to the, to the final 53, it's you're, I don't think any surprises at all. Fred, I thought maybe they would give. Damian Swan, mm -hmm. more time right. to develop. Surprised they didn't put him back on the practice squad? A little. Yeah. Yeah, because he would be eligible as a yes, 2000, 2015 mm -hmm. uh, fifth round pick, I believe, um, who play, was going to play a lot his rookie year until he dealt with multiple concussions. Right. Um, and sometimes I wonder, you know, with all his injury history, if that kind of affects mm -hmm. him because we've been seeing, you know, players with injury, mm -hmm. injury histories like Denel Ellerby. Mm -hmm. uh, the Saints kind of just saying we can't afford to wait yes. um, for you to prove that you're going to be reliably mm -hmm. available. Uh, so, you know, I think that Laven actually making the active roster is um, a minor surprise, but he looked good in the preseason. He did. Very, Especially on the special teams. Yeah, very encouraging. And Trey mm -hmm. Edmonds um, was a little harder, I think, for us not being really in the, in, you know, in the film sessions to evaluate, but a apparently looked Whatever his assignment was, right. you know, Sean Payton was convinced that he was doing a great job with it. Right. Um, he does have NFL pedigree, actually. So, mm -hmm. you know, his dad played for the uh, Miami Dolphins and mm -hmm. was in the Pro Bowl a few times. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, um, he was a surprise. And then it's also kind of surprising to see Austin Carr signed yeah. to active. Right, active. Right. Well, you can't put him in a practice squad because it would be right. wrong. Right, right. You know, so same, yeah. would be, same would be for the quarterback in BYU they picked up right. at this point. Well, I'm, I'm sure it's a look-see. They think he's got potential. At that point, they'll they'll try they'll try to you know groom yeah. him, so to speak. Guys, how, how good can this team be this year? Look, gosh, I, I'm hemmed and hawed, and, and and look, at my our, you know our colleagues. Nobody really wants to get out there and you know step out front on, on what this team's going to be this year. Everyone's cautiously optimistic on what's going on. Well, I'm going to go on the limb here, and and I, I, you know, those that watch this TV show and listen to my radio show, I'm probably more of a pessimist than an optimist. Okay. Uh, glass glass uh, half um, half full or half empty rather than half full, but I'm going to say ten and six, and, and I'm going to base that on, on on the improvement on defense. How good do you think these guys? I mean, I know you want to wait till the, the first three games, but just overall, is this a better team? A little bit better. I'm going to go nine and seven. Okay. Um, just a little bit better, but just depends on also if we can win the division. If you can win the division. You're, 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 you've definitely done better than the years before, but yeah, once again, it goes back to my theory that I said at the beginning of the show. I, I want to wait till week three or four, and that's when I feel like I can get a better feel of this mm -hmm. team. And um, what better way to do it for your first game Monday night, yep. prime time? No doubt about it. Mm -hmm. Brett? At the beginning of camp, I would have said that they're just as likely to go six and ten as ten. Or as 10 and 6 and it would really depend on a combination of factors from bounces of the ball mm -hmm. to injury luck um, and uh, and whether the young guys upon which they were relying were making the same mistakes that they've made the last two years. So now that I've seen them a whole preseason, um, I think that it's easier to be optimistic that they're moving in the right direction. They still will need luck with injuries, yes. especially after losing fairly to the mm -hmm. hard condition having to deal with Armstead being out. Um, I mean, it looks like he's coming back faster than normal, but you're still going to have a rookie at left tackle in game one of the season right. against a good defensive line, and that mm -hmm. could spell, that could spell but, trouble. But he you, got, you can scheme for that. You can scheme for that. You can give him help. Mm -hmm. But he got beat a few times and flagged in his first mm -hmm. game and, uh, for holding because he was scrambling mm -hmm. to <laughs> grab guys yes. uh, in San Diego. And so, you know, even though everyone says his talent is, is off the charts, you know, he's – they acknowledge he's a rookie with a learning curve at a very important position. So, you know, a lot of things have to go right uh, for them to win 10 games. But I would say that it looks more likely now than it did 
when they enter training camp with you know thinking Armstead's out till November mm -hmm. and you know Fairley's gone and right. you don't know how good on uh, you know how much improvement on your mod is going to make and stuff like that. Yeah, I would agree. Guys, a shift to uh, LSU, twenty-seven nothing with BYU. Dominated performance by the Tigers. I mean, BYU didn't cross midfield. They had seven Tigers that had a run and a catch in the game. First time that's happened since the seventies. Seventeen freshmen participated uh, in the, in the game against uh, against BYU. And of course, Danny Etling coming off that back surgery. I mean, he looked like he could make all the throws. He showed great poise, uh, command of the offense, and the fact that he didn't show a lot. About ten percent of the offense really has got to be encouraging. Uh, uh, for, the, for this team. Of course, we knew that, that, that Geis would be dominant, uh, which again, he was. It was a little different style of running the way they, the way they ran the football, but nevertheless, they ran the football. And uh, the only downside I saw was, was again, the kicking game. Uh, you know, uh, Goslin missed, missed a, a kick. You had the kickoffs that weren't going in, in, into, the, uh, into the end zone. Uh, from what I understand, that's the kicking uh, competition is back opened up again. But y your thoughts, what are your thoughts on the Tigers as, as they, they dominate um, in my opinion, BYU with, with Chattanooga on, on, on deck. Well, their, their new special teams coach is a guy that the Saints have seen, McMahon. Mm -hmm. he, so he's on the staff. Um, that, that was a shocker to me that the field goal, it was a chip shot from like, what, 37, 39 mm -hmm. yards, and he, then he missed it. Um, that's going to be an issue. Talking to um, Virg Osbury with LSU, he said that if you look back at the film, they only uh, ran – close to five to six plays, but it was in different formations. Yes. So that just tells me that uh, Matt Canada is keeping a lot of things under the vest. And I think they got a game in Tuscaloosa that you might see some plays that you've never seen. I think against Chattanooga this Saturday that um, they probably will run the same plays that they did against BYU, against Chattanooga, because let's be honest, that is going to be a win. And they don't want to you know, they don't want to do the trick plays or the deep, I would like to see some deep balls, but I don't think they're going to do like all these different plays just yet. Um, I think that's going to happen when they actually, when they matter, and that's the SEC games. And the defense just reminds me of the defense for the past years. They've been dominant. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, the Danny Antley made those passes to wide receivers and that caught balls. I don't think we had a drop ball. Mm -hmm. And um, that wide receiver core is great, and Darius Geis. I mean, it's a Darius Geis. He's gonna. He's a Heisman Trophy candidate, and he's a, he's a guy that will put put his head down and, and make plays mm -hmm. and score score touchdowns for you. Yeah, um, LSU in the red zone. LSU's receivers will have to figure out how to uh, get more separation okay. quickly, and Etling will have to become <coughs> more decisive in throwing into narrow windows in the red zone. Um, and that's where I think he had his biggest problems with indecision and, and throwing the ball away. But I will say, and there was a couple third down throws, he made throws in the middle of the field that required uh, strength, accuracy, and timing mm -hmm. on those throws. And he delivered them on the money, which his teammates said he would do coming off back surgery. They had noticed with him having you know more full body technique in his throws, mm -hmm. transferring his weight and everything, um, that he was more accurate. And the ball was where it was supposed to be. And then they caught it. Which, watching the spring game, I, I mean, the passing game looked awful. Right. Yeah. You know? And uh, so th that was very encouraging that, you know, they didn't throw the ball much, but when they threw it, there, were, there was evidence of serious passing plays being made in the middle of the field. And uh, the kind of plays you'll have to make against major competition. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I agree with, you know, uh, Robert. I mean, this game... They should just run all the same plays. You don't want to give Mississippi State anything new to look at. Um, you, you outsize and out talent them up front. Yes. Uh, I mean, they, just, they can run the ball at will. They probably, would, if anything, they just probably won't run Darius yeah. Geis as much, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Well, you're, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think you, you've got Williams or, 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 or you well. it, uh, Clyde Hilaire, and yeah. maybe they'll play Miles Brennan in the second half. Right. Which I think a lot of people want to see, and maybe uh, Loyal Norseese as well. See mm -hmm. him on the field as well. And I thought just. In, in, in the short snapshot that we saw, Brennan, didn't, the game didn't look too big for him, which is what you want to see out of a guy coming right out of high school. Right. He, uh, it didn't look big, but I, or I did ask Denny Atling on Tuesday when we uh, talked to the players. Maybe Brett may have heard this, but I asked him, did you joke with Miles about his mouthpiece? His mouthpiece, if you watch, was yes. still stuck in his helmet the whole right. time. 
and I was joking with people around me going at the during the game like he's nervous he still has not thought about the mouthpiece mm -hmm. and Danny goes well I mean yeah, he's trying to defend miles and said well he's you know he wants to be heard the mouthpiece kind of gets in the way but I've played football before my first football game I was a nervous wreck and the first thing that was missing was my mouthpiece mm -hmm. it was dangling down at my uh, face mask so I think even though he did well I would like to see him now hit the gym and put a little weight on him because mm -hmm. he looked like a, a, a very small bean pole right. out there against these huge guys that are trying right. to kill him. Right. Well, well, he added 20 pounds in the offseason, right? Right. I think yeah. he needs a little bit more, maybe. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I'm, that's just me. Mm -hmm. Lowell Narcisse is a big, big guy, mm -hmm. but I think he won't see that much action because he's still coming off of an injury. I think Coach O and them are kind of hesitant okay. and don't want to re aggravate right. his don't situation. Yeah. Right. It's pretty apparent to me that Ogeron can't wait to see Miles Brennan play more. And he will take every opportunity to get him in and develop him. I mean, Etling is the clear number one. He's not dissatisfied with Etling mm -hmm. in any way. But let's face it, Ogeron is in, wants this job for the long haul. Right. And, my, and Brennan could be the quarterback for the next three years. Yes. And every time LSU gets a big lead, I think Brennan's going in there and they're taking a look at at what he can do. As they should, considering yeah. this is the last year for Etling. And behind yeah. them, they have true freshmen. Yeah. Right. So I think, well, if, if the game gets out of hand by halftime, stick around, Tiger fans. Don't do the tradition by leaving. Mm -hmm. I think you'll see Miles Brennan in the second half, somewhat maybe the fourth quarter, if the game gets out of hand. Maybe stick around and watch the future of LSU. Mm -hmm. Don't right. go home and right. beat traffic. Right. Clyde, Clyde was hilarious. Obviously showed flashes the other night. Uh, you know, when you talk about 17 freshmen, and, and I had Glenn Gilbo on the program on my radio show this week, th there were a handful of freshmen that didn't play that are expected to play against Chattanooga this week. And that's the scary part, and which is, I mean, if the, the freshman that played against BYU was good, can you imagine, you know, the development of those guys that played and then the ones that do get to play, if they get to play, this Saturday? Um, the future looks good for LSU, and I think all those tales of Ogeron being the good recruit that he is that can recruit these guys, uh, it's going to be fruition, come up to fruition when uh, in the future. Right. Well, Brett, they got they, – you're at LSU. You're gonna get. You can, you can hold on to a guy about three years mm -hmm. if he's a quality player. So you better get him on the field as a freshman if you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean sometimes quarterbacks will stay uh, through their senior year. I've seen that happen a bit. But uh, you know whether you're talking about the Mannings, uh, Carson Palmer, I believe, and mm -hmm. some. You know, mm -hmm. um, where is it? Matt Liner, I'm thinking of, and maybe Palmer too. But and, anyway, well, the one Heisman and then yeah. jump to the to NFL. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know. So Brennan could potentially, depending on how things go, stay to his senior year. But um, you're right. You're going to want to see these. a lot of these players. They do have to get them in early. Yes. If they're going to be good enough for the NFL as juniors, they want to develop them now. And, um, and Ogeron, you know, is, I mean, this is his first recruiting class, mm -hmm. and he believes in these guys, and he wants to know exactly what he's got. Yep, and, and so far so good after game one. To the phone lines we go. 866-3200. Brian is in Metairie. Brian, welcome to Inside New Orleans Sports. Hey, Brian. Hi, gentlemen. How y'all doing? Doing great. Uh, first off, I want to ask a question, see what y'all think. I think the Monty kid played his heart out this year, and he got cut. They keep keeping an underachieving Anthony, in my opinion. I mean, the boy, they keep saying he's got potential, but potential don't win positions nor ball games. I, I just don't understand sometimes their choosing of keeping people. And one other question, did they keep Crawley? I sure hope not. Thank you, I'll listen. They, they did keep Crawley. And uh, I, I didn't get the, the Ma, line. I think Marty. He was Marty. talking about Marty. Oh, well, Rich Marty. Marty. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, Rich Marty. Michael, Michael, Michael Marty, Marty, pardon me. Marty. Going back in time, guys. Um, your thoughts? Um, I don't think it was that surprising with Marty's cut. I think, I think they looked at his health, and um, I forgot what his procedure was, but I, I think they kind of weighed that may have been a, a factor. Mm -hmm. And, and, and they might have thought that he may be a guy that if they have injuries down the line, they could bring him back. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, he had to outperform not just Anthony, who we arguably did outperform, right. but Anthony was hurt. Um, but Big Hill. But also Big Hill, right. who he, he didn't really outperform. No, he did. And Big Hill's on the practice squad. Mm -hmm. um, here's what I think about Motti is that uh, Sean Payton, and we've talked about his loyalty before and on the show mm -hmm. regarding assistant coaches, he cares about his players, and when Motti came in and did a workout, 
after having his surgery to remove his large intestine mm -hmm. because of an ulcerative colitis condition, I think is what it was. Right. It was. Um, and looked like he was in great physical shape. Peyton said, I have to give this guy a chance. I have to give him a chance. And if he earns it, he earns it. But I think he was always a long shot to make the roster. Um, but that being said, he did look pretty good. He claims that he's healthier physically and mentally than even before because before he was playing with the condition and now he's figured out how to work around it. Yes. So there is potential for him to come back if they have injuries because he can contribute on special teams. Yes. You know, so there is, and, and he, he and could knows, be back. And knows the system as well. And then Anthony also, they have so much invested in him as a first right. round pick in right. the finances that they can't really right. cut him yet. Right. 1.1 1. 1 million year. guaranteed this year. It would just yeah. be a, a tough cap right. hit, and a, you know, yeah. so and, and, that, that puts Mott, that makes it hard to keep Motti up. I would definitely agree. Uh, Greg is at home. Greg, welcome to Inside New Orleans Sports. Hey, Greg. Uh, hey, guys. My question is simply this. Um, from a talent standpoint, do you think we're more or less talented today than the team we had in 2009? From a talent standpoint, I'll hang up and listen. I, I say less talented. Yeah. Less I, think, I don't even think 2009 was a, a talented team. I think 2012, 2011 11, 11, 11 was, was the, the best team. The best team. Yeah. Just San Francisco just got the best of us. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, less talented the, by those two teams. Yeah. Probably less. It's, it's hard to know. It's, you got to see how. Chemistry is a big thing. Yeah, chemistry is a big thing. I mean, it really is a team game. Um, but. You know, I, I don't know if in 2009 they had any receiver that's quite as good as Michael Thomas. Right. right. Uh, you know, they didn't have Jimmy Graham yet, so Kobe Fleener is arguably a better weapon at tight end than they had in 2009. And then the linebacker core, I mean, you know, Vegeta and Shanley did a great job together. Vilma? Uh, Vilma was obviously, he was probably at that point in his career more talented than anybody they have now. Yeah. But if you look at the linebacker core as a whole, they might be more talented now than they yes. were in 2009. Yeah, but 39 turnovers was, was a big thing. Uh, but yeah, and then, of course, the secondary. I yeah. mean, you know, who knows if, uh, if Von Bell or, Kenny, or Caro or, uh, or Marcus Williams can <laughs> combine to even get as many interceptions right. as Darren Sharper right. got that year. It was, it, was, it, was, it was amazing. It really <laughs> was. Uh, Toby is in Gretna. Toby, welcome to uh, Inside New Orleans Sports. Hey, hey Toby. Yeah, uh, some of the... Uh, LSU freshmen that play, can they still be redshirted? And if they are, what are the rules of eligibility? And I'll hang up and listen. Thank right. you. Thanks. Guys, I'm not positive I, on it, but I think it, it doesn't go by how many quarters you play in, 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 a, uh, in a season on whether you can be redshirted or not. I believe it was games. Uh, was we it games? Talking, I think it's three games. Is it? Okay. Um, and then you have until week six to make okay. a decision, either right. red or gray. That's, it goes back to the Miles Brennan thing where do you burn that red shirt, let them stick it out for the rest right. of the season? Right. Well, again, at LSU, you look at a, team, at a player being there for three years. Mm -hmm. If they're good enough, they're going after their junior year uh, to the pros. Uh, Mike is at home. Mike, welcome to Inside New Orleans Sports. Hey, Mike. I have a, I have a few comments on LSU and the Saints. Mm -hmm. The Saints, first of all, the Saints, I hope they do well this year. But the thing that the, to look at is, how do they start? Because in the past years, they've been starting slowly. Yeah. So I hope they start fast, and that's going to uh, show you how the season's going to go. For us, LSU is, the main thing they have to do is beat Alabama in order to advance further than they've been in the past. In order to do that, I would look at the way Clemson and the Sean Watson played them in the championship game. Right. And uh, another thing, uh, a lot of people are t talking a lot about Miles Brennan. Mm -hmm. And they're not really talking about Lord Norcisa as much. And I think Lord, Lord Norcisa has more upside, mm -hmm. you know? Well, he's definitely, definitely more athletic and, and a bigger player, no doubt about it. Guys, um, uh, fast start, I, I, think the best they, I think the best they can do is two and two out the box, honestly. If they go three and one, you might be looking at a special season. Yeah, I mean, once again, it's, like I said, I'll wait, I'll, I'll wait to all my judgment until right. after week four. LSU with Lil Narcisse, I talked about that. I think mean, they were cautious about his injury. He, I mean, watching pregame and watching the quarterbacks throw and go through their routine in the pregame, Narcisse, yes, is like a huge human being. He is physically fit, mm -hmm. and we covered him during his prep season, and he was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. But once again, I think he, they're just going to wait on him to try to uh, see how, his, how he's feeling with his injury that kept him out uh, during the spring. Um, 
and I'm trying to remember what else he was talking about. There. About uh, how you how you take on Alabama. Well, the other team, there's two teams in Alabama that now you have to worry about. I think Auburn's going to be a, uh, play a big threat, mm -hmm. but the good thing is you play them here, not on the Plains. Tuscaloosa, I mean, that is the standard bearer of the SEC right now. How do you do against Alabama? And um, you're going to have to find out here soon. Yeah, Saints have gone one and three to start the last three seasons in their first four games, and they've talked about that a lot, and that's clearly a theme in the mm -hmm. locker room uh, and from the coaches to that, you know, the schedule looks tough, but they, ha they have to have a really strong start to the season. Two and two, I think, would be acceptable. Mm -hmm. Another one and three puts them behind the eight ball, just like they've been the last yes. three seasons, and they finished seven and nine. Yep. So, uh, you know, it doesn't mean they can't overcome it, but it just gets really hard. There's no room for error yeah. the rest of the year. So, uh, and, and a then, tough division. And, and, and the division looks really tough. Yeah. So, um, I mean, they could easily finish last in that division and not be that bad mm -hmm. of a team. Yeah, I agree with that. So. Guys, Tulane beats Grambling 43-14. Uh, to 14. Looks like they found a quarterback. Jonathan Banks, 10-15, uh, 185 yards, three touchdowns through the air, 16 uh, rushes for 69 yards, a touchdown on the ground. Uh, the offensive line played well. Uh, a very experienced defense played re very well for the Greenies as well. They got a big test against Navy this week and that triple option. Well, not only this week, but I think the next two or three weeks, they, they've got a big, big test. And um, against Navy, Navy, you know, they got that triple option. They, they're, they're very sound. They're very disciplined. It is going to be a tough test. And, um, yeah, Tulane, I, I, I hope and pray every night they do well and they can get more seats. They said 15,000 mm -hmm. uh, uh, fighting against LSU and everything else that was going on in the city on Saturday. Jonathan Banks seems to be like the, the, the man, the quarterback for, uh, for, for, for Willie Fritz and the Green Wave. Yeah. Brett? I was surprised because Grambling brought some people. Yeah, they I did. Mean, that means Tulane didn't do so hot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they need to show up. If, if they win, <laughs> yeah, I, I think, I, I think will. The, the student body will show up, and I think New Orleans will show yeah, up. Yeah, it's because, you know what, that's like one of the best places mm -hmm. ever to watch a football mm -hmm. game. They really, really did a nice job right. in that stadium. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's – encouraging signs uh, from the quarterback and the defense you know they did well against Navy mm -hmm. last year they were in that game yeah. the fourth quarter without a quarterback that's right so you know they've lost a couple good players on defense particularly Nico Marley but as a whole if they're as sound you know scheme wise as they were last year against Navy and a lot of those kids did mm -hmm. play against Navy and know what to do right could be interesting played a lot of freshmen last year for, for two yeah. million those guys yeah. got a lot of experience in a Willie Fritz system it's year two for them better than what maybe you've seen for guys that are just coming in. And, uh, you know, I think that makes a really big difference for them going forward. Mm -hmm. So, again, optimism reigns, at least on this program for this week. We'll see how we feel <laughs> next week and the week after that. But uh, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit optimistic going forward. Brett Martell, the Associated Press. Uh, Robert O'Shields, ABC 26 Sports. Thanks for being with us tonight on the panel. Great. Thanks so much for tuning in. Remember, there's a rebroadcast of this program each and every Friday night right here on WLAE TV at 10 p.m. We're also on the Pelican Sports Network. That's 9 o'clock on Fridays. That is statewide. And, of course, on the Cox Cable tier now, uh, Thursday nights at 10, 2 a.m. on Saturday morning. Uh, don't forget to catch me on the radio, 990 a.m. WGSO. That's 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. weekdays. You can listen live, download the podcast at ericasher.com. Also, you can check us out on the TuneIn Radio app. Remember, all the previous episodes of Inside New Orleans Sports can also be seen at ericasher.com at your leisure. Again, thanks to our uh, guests tonight, Brett Martell and Robert O'Shields. Also to the uh, WLE production staff. They do a great job behind the scenes. We appreciate them so much. Ron Yeager, Jim Dotson, Kenny Juno, Trey Lopez, and my director, William Hill. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next week for another edition of Inside New Orleans Sports. Have a great week until then. <laughs>